welcome to the 2021 Spring Partnership Meeting of the South Mountain Partnership. I am Katie Hess, Director of the Partnership. And as a reminder, our meetings are where our region comes together to build knowledge, uh, contacts, and collaborations around the promotion and preservation of our region's farmland, historic places, and natural and recreational assets. Um, today, you are joined by 100 or so fellow registrants from local citizens, businesses, nonprofits, academic institutions, and local, state, and federal governments, uh, which are operating in Adams, Cumberland, Franklin, and York counties. At this time, I'm pleased to offer the floor to Adams County Commissioner Randy File. And um, I believe he already has his video and microphone turned on. Uh, Commissioner File has been a great supporter of the partnership for a long time. However, it has been a few years since we have heard him uh, speak. So thank you, Commissioner File, for being here. And uh, you can feel free to take over. All right, well, thank you. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, you know, on behalf of the uh, Adams County Commissioners and also our planning staff, uh, I want to welcome everybody to beautiful Adams County this morning. And even though we're here virtually, you're, you're seeing slides on the screen as I'm speaking, uh, I can assure you that it is very beautiful. If you, if you don't believe me, uh, just take some time to take a drive through the orchards and the mountains right now and see the dogwood and the red bud and the fruit blossoms and it just couldn't be any uh, more gorgeous than it is right now. We are certainly pleased to again host the spring meeting of the partnership and look forward to hopefully being able to welcome everybody in person in the not too distant future. Now I was saying to Katie prior to coming on air that uh, there's really hope because I'm also on the County Commissioners Association Board of Directors and yesterday we voted unanimously to hold the, the uh, summer conference in August in person and Hershey. So uh, we are making some progress in that regard. So uh, I'm sure and hope we'll be seeing each other soon. Uh, I want to especially thank the uh, and recognize the South Mountain Partnership Committee members and staff, uh, given the importance of bringing this needed information to our communities and region. Today's topic uh, is solar development and it's certainly one of the uh, important issues for our regions. In, in Adams County, we are keenly aware of that because we have, it's, it's a hot button topic right now. Uh, and in fact, um, I serve in the Board of Land Conservancy and uh, Sarah mentioned that this would be the topic uh, of the uh, meeting today and there was certainly keen interest and a question was asked, is it being recorded? So uh, I, I see that it is. It's, solar development have presented both an opportunity and a threat within the South Mountain region. The opportunity is that it offers the potential of diversifying energy supply from a sustainable source, reducing our dependence on natural resources and our fossil fuels. The threat is that solar development projects can have impacts on the very landscapes that make the South Mountain region so special. The Adams County Commissioners recognize that responding to the solar development issue means finding the right balance with economic, environmental, and property owner rights on both sides. This means allowing solar development with the right projects in the right places and in a manner that reflects our quality of life and unique South Mountain landscape. The commissioners recognize that our local municipalities must be centrally involved in managing this issue. While the county has a role in this process, in Pennsylvania, for better or worse, I, I like to say our forefathers determined that they wanted power in the hands of residents at the local level. And thus our municipalities of which there are 34 in Adams County, have different sets of zoning, land use, and values. So on behalf of my fellow commissioners and our planning staff, we are looking forward to today's presentation so that we may all learn more about solar development issues and how we may respond to them together as the South Mountain region. So again, thank you for allowing me to uh, 
uh, welcome you today. Uh, welcome to Adams County. And um, uh, I look forward to uh, hearing the remarks in the meeting. Thanks so much, Commissioner. That was fantastic. Next, we are handing the floor over to Patty Knitterhouse um, and Penn National Golf Course Community, our sponsor of today's event. Thank you, Katie. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Um, my name is Patrice Knitterhouse, and um, my husband and I are the developers of Penn National Golf Course Community, which is at the base of the Meeting of the Pines in Michaux State Forest. I've been involved with South Mountain Partnership since its infancy and am impressed with the opportunities that the partnership creates for communication and connection across county lines. It's the only organization uh, that, uh, that I am part of that, that creates as much cooperation um, as I see going on. The partnership's vision of a landscape of conserved resources and vibrant communities sharing a common sense of place and collaborate, collaborating on well-planned growth and sustainable economic development is kind of what brings us here today. Um, the mission of conserving landscape resources um, is, is what we're gonna be looking at. Our landscape resource, when you think about resources, you think about, you don't necessarily think about landscape, but that's what South Mountain Partnership uh, has focused on, our landscape resource. Solar development will greatly impact our landscape and we need to understand what it means to us. Uh, as Commissioner Files said, there's gotta be a balance so that we can provide affordable energy and also maintain the beauty of, uh, of the South Mountain. We have some of the most fertile agricultural land in the state of Pennsylvania. And uh, keeping that growing food um, is, you know, whether it's orchards or whether it's, uh, you know, farmland, uh, is, is what creates the beauty, the growing green things that are around here. Solar farms um, don't really grow anything, they create energy. They're more in industrial use than they are in agricultural use. So through our local zoning codes, it is the local townships that have the opportunities to direct and plan where solar projects can be placed within our townships. Becoming knowledgeable about the threats and the opportunities of solar development and supporting the efforts of our townships in their planning is what's going to help us get out ahead of this. And that's what we're going to hear about today. This is uh, an opportunity to learn what we need to know to be prepared and to support our township, all of our townships. Um, so, one thing I do want to also mention, we just uh, finished uh, uh, an effort to stop a pipeline, a power line that was coming through Franklin County that was proposed to come through Franklin County, uh, stop Transource. And uh, through the efforts of South Mountain Partnership and many, many, many people within the region, we were able to be successful in that. Uh, for anyone who wants to learn more about that uh, Stop Transfers project, we still have outstanding legal fees that we're working on um, paying, and the GoFundMe uh, Stop Transfers site is still open, and uh, we would appreciate your support on that also. I pass this back to you, Katie. Thank you, Patty. That was wonderful. So, um, unbeknownst to me, our first two presenters and speakers just perfectly summarized what I was going to say on this slide. So I think 
we're just going to move forward. Maybe the only thing I will mention is, you know, just that theme of balance, finding the balance. We know that solar is coming. We know that our, our society needs it. Um, but there are some things at stake, you know, um, there are, there's always a, a, a dark side, if you will, to energy development. And it's usually those local communities near that energy development that, that bear the brunt of that burden. So like Patty said, we just want to become much more knowledgeable as a region and support um, our communities and municipalities and making the best decisions for them and citing the right projects in the, in the right locations and encouraging them at the right scales. So um, I think briefly, I'll just mention what is at stake? You know, we talk about the landscape, but what specifically is at stake in the South Mountain uh, region? We have large tracts of affordable open space that's ideal for development. And this land is often already contributing ecosystem services such as air and water purification and acting as an existing carbon sink. Um, also on that land are things like existing farmland, really important to our identity and our local food systems. As Patty mentioned, one of the largest deposits of contiguous prime agricultural soils in Pennsylvania and one of the last regions in the United States to retain a small diversified uh, farming structure. We have unique wildlife, uh, headwaters, habitat corridors and bird flyways, historic landmarks in places like rural historic districts, indigenous Native American sites, revolutionary and civil war sites, um, and you know the story of uh, well, we're the landscape through which tens of thousands of European immigrants, you know, flowed and um, resettled this country. And lastly, our favorite pastime as South Mountain residents is outdoor recreation. We love our land. We love our landscape and all of those local parks and those trails, their associated view sheds, the Appalachian National Scenic Trail and its view sheds, world-class fishing streams, country roads and a growing tourism industry that's based on our beautiful landscape and the agriculture and the cultural tourism. So just some things to keep in mind as um, we explore more about, about solar. So um, one last note that it's our thought that today's event may be the first of several about solar development. We will be asking you what you and your communities need to know more about. And we will use your feedback to explore the planning of more solar energy learning events over the remainder of this year. So stick with us throughout the meeting, keep an open mind, ask questions, and be sure to give us your feedback. But first, <laughs> some updates about the South Mountain Partnership. Our committees have been really hard at work uh, over the winter and the spring. I have quite a few updates and I will try to keep short, such as the South Mountain Mini Grant Program is open. Um, the pre-applications are due by May 28th, that's a Friday. And our priorities, through this year are still focused on water resource projects with measurable outcomes. And we'd really love to see some projects that assist local municipalities and counties in meeting pollution reduction goals or implementing actions that they have um, adopted, either you know, watershed management, restoration, um, total, um, daily load uh, projects or wellhead projects. So um, that doesn't mean that those are the only types that are eligible. That just means that those are our priority areas. So if you are interested in learning more about 
the mini grant program, please go to our website. It's southmountainpartnership.org. And you should be able to have a direct link from our homepage to the mini grant uh, section of our website. Next, we'd like to talk a bit about the Friends of the South Mountain Partnership. If you don't already know, we launched this group last summer to provide resources to further support the work of the South Mountain Partnership. And we're off to a great start. We have partnered with the Foundation for Enhancing Communities as our physical sponsor. We are one of their projects. And you can participate in the Friends Group by becoming a member, by donating, or through our corporate sponsorship program. And although it says corporate sponsorship, you don't have to be a corporation or even a business. You can participate in that as an individual if you wish. Um, so feel free to reach out to me for, with more, uh, for more details with that. And that information is available on our website under our Get Involved tab. I see some of you taking notes. So I'm trying not to go too quickly. We are recruiting for the following committees. Um, for the first time, we are implementing term limits to our committees. And so we will start having some, some committee turnover this year and next year. And so we are uh, starting to actively recruit for our communications subcommittee, our program subcommittee, our fundraising committee, which is just starting, just getting off the ground, and our leadership committee. And we are looking for people who are really strong communicators, who are active doers and really like to take action and get things done. And we think that uh, this is a perfect opportunity for young professionals, people who are building up their resume or um, retired individuals. So if, if you wanna learn more about that, uh, please consider reaching out to me. If you know you want to you know, throw your hat into the ring, please send me a letter of interest and your resume. And we will uh, absolutely do our best to get you into the right subcommittee and that letter of interest doesn't need to be anything formal just you know it can be a casual introduction of yourself uh what your interests are what your skill set is and uh you know why you want to be part of this an update about our our new hire for the first time we're going to have two staff members as part of the South Mountain Partnership. And we are um, actively interviewing top candidates for that program manager position. We were thrilled that we had over 30 uh, great candidates apply from, uh, I think mostly the East Coast and our partnership with the Appalachian Trail really helped us to spread the word and attract some, some really great candidates. Uh, we will be holding final interviews next week, and we hope to be able to make an announcement either in late May or early June. So um, stick close, and um, we'll be announcing that in our newsletter. I'm really excited to also uh, show you the South Mountain Directory. You, um, if you were part of our mailing list, you would have gotten an opt-in email over the past month that allowed you to opt in to our directory. And this is something that we undertook because at the fall meeting, if you were part of that, you'll remember that we had breakout groups. We had facilitated breakout groups and we collected a lot of really great information from our regular attendees about why they're attending and how we could better support folks, especially during COVID when we can't get together in person. And one of the things that we heard in multiple breakout groups was that, you know, we come together, you know, a few times a year and there's so much energy and we love seeing one another. But then when we 
go back to our respective places within the region, it's really hard to link up with people. And so this directory is meant to um, help solve that. So we have about 45, in the, close to 50 people signed up now. And um, we'll do another call, an, another opt-in call via email. So if you wanna be part of that, um, look for our email, make sure that you're on our newsletter list. And um, let's see if I can give you a sneak peek. This isn't the best screen to show you on, but this is generally what the directory looks like. It's sortable by organization, by organization type. So you'll see here, you can sort by, by gut, like uh, government or municipality, nonprofits, businesses, academic institutions, and you can sort by city. And one of the coolest things I think is that you can see which contacts are already working in which counties. You can sort by that. So this shows me who is currently working in Franklin County. But then if I wanted to potentially find partners in who are interested in working in York County, for instance, I can search interested counties and I, I can find um, those types of organizations as well. Lastly, there's an area of interest. So if you're interested in a specific thing like the arts or economic development or just tourism, you can also find partners who are interested in the same things as you. All right, lastly, save the dates for our fall partnership meeting, which will be held on September 17th of this year from 9 a.m. to noon. And we're hoping that that will take place in person. And this will be hosted by Cumberland County. So it will happen somewhere in Cumberland County. And also save the date for the 11th annual Power of the Partnership celebration. That will be held January 21st, 2022. And that typically lasts from 8 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. And that is to be held in Franklin County. Okay, well, thanks for hanging in there with me. We're going to transition now to Tyler Sender to talk with us about a new initiative out of DCNR to collect uh, success metrics about or through our conservation landscapes. Katie, can you hear me okay and see the screen? All right. So good morning, everyone. Tyler Sender here, the in internal DCNR lead for the South Mountain Partnership. Um, before I begin, I'll just say thank you again, everyone, for attending another awesome spring partnership meeting. I still think it's pretty amazing that we can keep the energy in these virtual meetings. So I can't imagine we get back in person, which I'm really looking forward to seeing all of you and shake your hands again. And thank you to Commissioner File, Patty, and the other panelists for being here. And I will second his comment about Adams County being a very beautiful place. That's actually one of my most favorite places to get lost. Um, just turn off the phone and drive um, and you won't regret it. Um, so I wanted to update the broader partnership today um, on an effort that's underway at DCNR and across all of our conservation landscapes in 2021. So this is the first year that we are attempting to uh, collect data and establish metrics for our conservation landscapes. So, and just a little bit of background on that before I give you what this might look like for the South Mountain Partnership. Um, so this stemmed from an evaluation of the conservation landscape program we did in 2019. And that's what you see on the left here is the cover of this report. And if anyone's interested, I think if you Googled 2019, maybe Pennsylvania Conservation Landscapes Report or Search Models of Successful Collaboration, you should be able to find this report. Um, but 
back in 2018 and 2019, the conservation landscape program was approaching 15 years in the works. And we felt that some type of evaluation or assessment was needed to see how we can better improve on the program and sustain it for another 15 years. One of the recommendations that came out of this report uh, was to create a uniform framework for the evaluation and measurement of work, AKA metrics. So that's a little bit of the why um, on our efforts to collect data and establish metrics for the first time. Um, so now a little bit for the what. So as the DCNR team and our partners were building the framework for how this data collection was going to work, there was four overarching, overarching goals that stood out that we felt that all conservation landscapes are working towards in some way, shape, or form. So these are conservation and stewardship, outreach and engagement, outdoor recreation, and economic benefits or impact. So these are basically our four buckets. So view these as our four buckets that all conservation landscapes will have, and they'll be trying to collect data within each year. Now within each bucket, we will have specific, specific pieces of data that we'd be looking to collect each year. So for 2021, you'll see we have some of the things we're targeting are acres protected or restored, partnerships built, trail miles constructed or restored, and mini grants or grants completed. Now I know I'm pretty general here and everyone's probably wondering like, what do you mean by acres protected or restored? Or what does that mean by partnerships built? So I'll say that this is just kind of a broad overview I'll get into some of those details and, and that more information that might be needed to, to touch on these things. But for now, th this is the what. This is the four buckets, and this is some of the specific pieces of data we'd be looking to collect. So we covered the why, talked a little bit about the what. So how about the how and the when of uh, data and metrics? So Katie and I worked with our leadership committee, and we felt since this is the first year, let's keep it simple. And we did that. So what we did is we used Google and we built a simple Google form, and this is gonna be our public interfacing form. We call this our shared metrics input form. So I don't have the link here and I'm not gonna show it today, but I'll, I'll touch on that in a bit. But we felt for 2021, this will probably be one of the best ways that we can interact with our partners uh, to get data inputted in. So that's the how. So another question is, when do we input data? Um, so this public input form is gonna be open throughout the year. Since this is our first year, we have a little bit of a late start, but come 2022, come January 1 of 2022, that form is gonna be open and available to our partners for data to be inputted. Um, and our plan is to put a call out twice a year. We're gonna put out a call during the spring partnership meeting, the fall partnership meeting, and again at the end of the year. Um, another question that everyone's consider is, when do we know when we should collect data and input it in the form and when we shouldn't? And to me, that was a big question um, to answer. So there's a couple key criteria to consider um, to, that dictates, yes, we'd wanna collect that data and no, we don't need to collect that data. The first is, is something considered a key resource of the South Mountain Partnership? That's a big one. Was there direct involvement from the South Mountain Partnership? Because if there was, it's a pretty good indicator that whatever was completed, we'd wanna try to collect that data. Did it occur within the South Mountain Partnership boundary? or maybe adjust adjacent to the boundary because that's not a hard and fast line. And last, was it completed by a South Mountain Partnership primary or significant partner? Now, again, I can see everyone's wheels turning. You're probably thinking, well, what do you mean by a key resource? Like, what does that mean? What's a key resource? Or who's a primary or significant partner? So there's still some um, questions that we will answer. But that kind of takes me into the what's next here. So our next steps, I'm gonna provide uh, an email, send an email out to the partnership, and I'm gonna provide a few things. One of them is I'm gonna provide a link to that metrics form, that shared public metrics form, because within that explains a lot of detail around some of those specific pieces of data we're looking to collect. Also in the email, I'm gonna to touch on some of those things I noted that we probably need further information that need further clarification. Um, once that email comes out, if we have partners who feel that they understand it, like, hey, you know, we're working on stuff, we're getting stuff done, you know, we're cool, we can get it into that form, more power to you. But we are absolutely open to setting up further meetings to discuss how this input form will work, answer any questions, and also even assisting with getting data inputted in there. And I will leave everyone with kind of this, these last two thoughts. I know this is just another thing. I'm always hesitant about those all oh, just another things, but 
I think everyone probably realizes the tremendous value of collecting data and establishing metrics uh, for organizations looking to grow or looking to strengthen their foundation. I feel like that is a key piece of ingredient to the success recipe is having data and metrics. And also, Katie and I both realize that this is a really good way for us to give recognition to all of our awesome partners who are doing work across the landscape. So I'll just kind of end with those two thoughts on a positive and my contact information is here. If anyone needs to reach me at any time, phone or email, don't hesitate to reach out. Even if it's not regarding data or metrics, I wanna be here and open to the partnership. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Katie and Elizabeth and we'll, we'll get into the, the good part of uh, today's presentation. Thanks. Thanks, Tyler. We are running ahead of schedule. <laughs> when does that happen? <laughs> so um, I think knowing that we will still transition to Elizabeth Grant to introduce our speakers and we'll roll this extra time into our Q&A after our speaker presentations. Thanks, Katie. I'm Elizabeth Grant, a planner with Cumberland County's Planning Department, and I also serve as the chair of the program committee of South Mountain Partnership. The topic of solar development in our region was in many ways a natural outgrowth of the Climate Action Series, which South Mountain Partnership co-hosted in 2020. We definitely find ourselves as a region on the edge of increased prospects for solar development. As the state moves forward to meet climate action goals for renewable energy, and municipalities throughout the state are getting engaged with climate action planning on the local level. We want to see renewable energy expand and also recognize that our landscape has many values with rich agricultural land and key natural areas that it contains. Locating these installations at appropriate scales and sites is key towards protecting these landscape values. One of the strengths of South Mountain Partnership is facilitating discussions like this one to help us determine what tools are needed to respond to these challenges and opportunities. Our speakers today are topic experts in the areas of solar development trends, co-location, and development. After the presentations, as Katie mentioned, we will moderate a question and answer session. Please just go ahead and submit your questions during the presentation in the using the chat feature kind of in the center button below your screen. And um, as time allows, which, which Katie mentioned, we will um, have an opportunity to um, gather your feedback uh, following uh, this, these presentations. And we're hoping to get at what you would like to see um, in terms of further content that South Mountain Partnership will facilitate um, to inform in greater detail and in depth um, on solar development issues in our region. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce the following speakers. Thomas Murphy is director of the Penn State Marcellus Center for Outreach and Research, where he provides consultation in natural resource development and energy transitions, specifically at the convergence of shale, gas, and renewables. Sarah Nicholas is the policy strategist at PASA Sustainable Agriculture, where she serves with staff, members, and outside stakeholders to identify and advance ways to improve soil health, economic and environmental sustainability, and conservation. And Doug Nidick is the Chief Executive Officer of Greenworks Development, which is focused on innovative, cost-effective solar energy solutions for educational, public, nonprofit, and commercial users. Thank you. Okay, at this time, we're going to welcome Thomas Murphy to share his presentation and screen. Good morning, Tom. Thanks so much for joining us.
Katie, can you hear me okay? We can hear you. We saw your screen for a moment and then we lost it. All right. Okay, so we see your PowerPoint software. Um, <laughs> would you would you uh, humor me and try the slideshow tab at the at the top there? Yeah, the trouble is I can't see it. Um, I'd have to admit I have not had this problem with a Zoom before. I mean, I can see it, but I uh, it's blocked. Okay. Well, would you like for me to, I have a, a backup here on my screen. Do you want me to share my screen and you can tell um, me when to advance your slides? Just one more second here. You did say you were a moment ahead of time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Maybe we can still resolve this. I just can't quite, here we go. Now I can there you go. Okay, all right. Perfect. I just couldn't see it because of some of the other control features for Zoom there. It just happened to be blocking it. So apologies. Um, again, um, uh, thank you for the, the chance to be here and present. Uh, listening to the comments that have been made so far about solar, um, it's interesting to see where this uh, conversation has gone in just a, sh a short period of time. And we're going to talk about some of the things. And I think my task here this morning is to, to kind of paint a a higher level picture of where some of the trends are with solar and, and what we can expect possibly going forward. So we'll, we'll give some context to that on a national basis as well as bringing it back to Pennsylvania. And then I think we're gonna zoom in a little bit more, drill down a little bit more. We think about, well, what would that mean for Adams County? So again, think about my comments in, in that sort of a realm or that sort of a space. Uh, one of the things we recognize, though, is there, there is a lot of utility scale solar that's coming to Pennsylvania and beyond Pennsylvania, we think about some of the contiguous states, and we can expect to see that uh, over, the, um, over the course of time here. If you're not familiar with uh, what MCOR is, I think our, our name is uh, maybe not telling the whole story at the moment, but we're really a group now that's not just invested in the, in the shale conversation, but we're really invested in this this location where shale energy and uh, renewables, uh, largely the uh, utility scale solar, converge. And a lot of the lessons that we learned in the shale story working with landowners across Pennsylvania are really applicable when we think about um, uh, the solar side or renewables. And we really see ourselves now in the energy transition space. So I think that's really the important takeaway. The other is we look at the topic, uh, the renewables topic, in this case, uh, utility scale solar, uh, very holistically. And as you can see from the slide, there's a lot of different things that we consider in both the research and the outreach that we do to uh, bring people to the conversation to understand it. I would put a disclaimer in here real quick that um, we're not advocating for solar, just like we didn't advocate for the shale energy side. Uh, what we're trying to do is explain it, bring uh, good science to the table, determine what the gaps are and help people like the group that's assembled here today, uh, determine what's missing from the conversation. What do we need to know? Uh, how can we educate ourselves? How can we educate others? How can we form policy? How can we influence legislators? Any and all those things. And that's our role as educators, not advocates of, of any particular energy system here. So that's the role that we play. Up to this point, and, and even thinking about the commissioner's comments and the role that, that municipalities play, uh, we've held about 40 webinars already on this uh, broader topic. I have a colleague that's sitting in on this call that's been working with the um, landowners on leases, for instance. Again, we're not advocating for people to lease their land, but if they are going to do that, they need to make sure that they're well informed to understand what's in a lease and the fact that they're going to be bound to that lease for a long, long time, uh, likely multi-generational impacts. So make sure you get that part right uh, if you choose to move forward. And again, that, those are lessons that we learned from the shale side that we're applying here. So our job is, is uh, to educate in that space and that's really where we're, where we're going. When we think about um, the, the, um, the paradigm or the energy paradigm out there and several have reflected it on already, 
we know that it's shifting and there's a whole lot of drivers for that. And we're gonna talk about that, or I'm gonna mention that for a couple of different slides here, a couple of different reasons quickly. Uh, we know that there's pricing opportunities are coming from, from energy and we know solar prices are coming down, that's a driver. Uh, we know that there's uh, things like political realities. We saw a change in Washington, for instance, and that's really changed the conversation about uh, this type of energy or that type of energy. So, you know, political uh, dimension is going to be a big part. Uh, culturally, even some of the comments here today, uh, you know, we want to see this versus see that. Uh, that's part of that uh, societal change or cultural change that we're all part of as well. Everybody's driving for a low carbon or a no carbon future. Uh, we recognize some of the economic considerations in this and just, you know, we think about business. Uh, many of the big business providers that, that we buy uh, stuff from are saying, well, we want our energy coming from uh, low carbon or no carbon type sources and not from where it had been in the past. So all those things are drivers and likely we'll see uh, many more of them going forward. We worked on a project in 2018, 2019, that I think was very informative. It was across the state. Um, a core group of people, Pennsylvania Energy Horizons. I don't know if there was a representative from this group uh, in there. DCNR was represented, I know, um, and uh, DEP. But a lot of other groups, and utilities, and just, again, a lot of different uh, voices. Um, and we were looking at, well, what are some of the different energy scenarios that, that uh, Pennsylvania could see if you looked out through the year 2040? And we put together several. So we were trying to look ahead. This could be in terms of policy, where we would be going, different types of energy, all those different bits, bits and pieces. One of the things that came out of that very clearly, a couple of different scenarios, and what they pointed to was we're going to see more gas in the, in the, in the near term, we'll call it, near midterm, 25 years. And we were going to see uh, definitely a decarbonization process. And they might seem counterintuitive one against the other, uh, but that was the reality or is the reality. And I think some of the other statistics I'll show will kind of prove that out. Uh, but that's like, and this is projection, this is looking ahead, uh, but that's, that's what we were seeing. So more gas because of the resource here and decarbonization, meaning more renewables going forward. If we look at Pennsylvania, I think it's instructive to look at um, some of the statistics in a couple quick snapshots. So where were we getting our, our energy? Again, we're talking about solar energy today, so it kind of fits in. Not a lot from renewables, and you can see that if you look at 20, 20 2007 and 2019, uh, you can see some different snapshots of, you know, we're seeing diminishment of coal. Um, Pennsylvania has been a big coal producing state. A lot of that goes to power. We see a lot more gas. So that's one of those big changes. It kind of fits into that scenario uh, moment that I mentioned uh, just a moment ago. So less coal, more gas, and you can see the doubling renewables, but still a very low amount. You're going to see in a moment here that's changing and changing since that time frame. A couple snapshots again, if you look at that, if that was Pennsylvania, what is it on a national basis? Again, some of these bigger uh, trends and themes out there. Uh, you can see renewables, slight uptick. You can see coal, a big drop. You can see gas still rising. Again, these are a couple comparative moments here that I think there's some value in understanding. And trying to answer the bigger question here with utility scale solar, why here, why now? Uh, so we'll try to uh, delve into a couple of them, but I think these graphics help us to understand that uh, in the why here, why now part. Uh, if you look at that again on a national basis and break that down a little bit, you see natural gas out through the year. And the, again, these are projections, uh, but you can see where we are essentially and where we're heading. Natural gas uh, over time being relatively flat. Um, uh, nuclear going down a little bit, coal dropping still a lot, again, out through 2050, but still in the mix. Projections, see them that way. Uh, but you see the renewables piece definitely increasing, and then a breakdown. Well, what does that mean? If you start to split that out, you can see a lot more solar in that. So again, one more reminder, projections. But based on uh, trends that we're seeing, based on investment, based on societal demands, uh, business uh, demand, a lot of different things driving those uh, projections uh, looking out. Now, what does that mean for Pennsylvania? A moment ago, I saw, I showed a slide, it was just uh, about 2%. In that time frame from 2007 to 2019, you saw we doubled the amount of renewables, sounds like a lot, but we only went from 1% to 2%. But if you look at the number of projects that are in the PJM queue right now, uh, solar projects, you can see there's 370 projects, utility scale solar projects in the queue, 370 projects. 
So it's a lot more now measured in gigawatts of power um, based on what it was we went back just a couple of years ago. So a big trend in terms of the difference. So I remind everybody again, I'm not advocating for anything here, just trying to explain the trends and you know where we see this process is going. Um, so again, a lot more projects uh, on the horizon here. Uh, one thing that I will say is just because a project has been proposed and is in the queue, does not mean it'll be built. Industry's uh, expectation is somewhere between uh, 10 and 20% of those projects uh, will be built in the end. So projects go into the queue, they fall out of the queue, new ones are added, but the reality is probably somewhere between 10 and 20% will be built. Uh, but still you can see it's a significant wave and you can see a big uptick in just a very recent uh, time frame. So again, the why here, why now question. Um, well, where are those projects? Some, some uh, data we borrowed from uh, our colleagues at DEP. You can see where this is spread around the state. Um, again, there's 370 projects that are currently in the queue, and the number is always changing. Um, and you also might wonder if well, there's 370 in the queue, how many have actually been built? And the reality is it, that number is seven. So a big difference between uh, what has been, um, what is in the queue or what has been proposed and what's actually on the ground. Now you can break this down and look at how many are, are you know, further in the process. You can see the uh, review um, uh, clip on the side, the key on the side. Um, so, you know, some are, are different stages. And again, some of those will, will go through the end and, and some not so much. Um, I think a, a question, and again, I'm referencing back to the commissioner's comments about um, acreage and uh, current use of land. In fact, many people have talked about that here that preceded me. Um, you get an idea of, of the amount of, of land or acres that, that could be uh, potentially tied up when we, when we look at this. Um, so what this is, is looking at megawatts of uh, power relative to uh, the landscape. So you can put a couple of these slides together and then see what the land impact uh, would be in that regard. Um, there is a projection that this could be upwards of 80,000 acres of, of land in Pennsylvania between now and 2030. Obviously, all that's not going to be in the south central part of the state, but the south central part of the state, for the reasons that were given before uh, by others, is, is definitely a hotspot. And you can see that from, from the uh, graphic there as well. But some of the other um, drivers, um, again, you know, thinking about this from a kind of a high level, uh, what's pushing it forward? Well, you have societal, and I referenced a little bit of that in the beginning. Uh, but people are changing what they want. We want our power coming from this and not that. And as that is the case, then you're going to start to see things uh, fall in and out of the mix, meaning more renewables in the mix. Uh, there's certainly a, a push right now. In fact, I saw some uh, media commentary yesterday. Uh, legislatively, we want, um, you know, this was uh, at the federal level, uh, groups are pushing, we want 100% renewables and no fossil, no nuclear. Um, so, you know, is that realistic is, I think, one of the questions. And a lot in the energy sector and a lot of political leaders would say, that's not feasible. You need other types of baseload as well. Um, and that could be argued here. Uh, there's the political forces. We just saw that, you know, one federal administration, we want this and, and you know, not so much that next administration. So we have these, it's different. So we have these different four-year cycles. We see a lot of investment coming in. Uh, this is expected to be a $13 billion investment in, in Pennsylvania between now and, and 2030 uh, with a number of projects that I mentioned uh, before. So a lot of investment or a lot of investors uh, chasing uh, opportunities here. There's a big climate metric. I think everybody is well aware of that. I'm not going to go into that in depth, but you know, just to make sure it's on the table. And then there's a big question about where is the energy technology? Storage would be a, a, um, a good uh, comment to make there. Uh, we need storage to make renewables work if it's 100% renewables. Uh, and the storage technology is not exactly uh, developed out to where it needs to be. So still a lot of research, a lot of development, a lot of investment uh, that will need to be made in that regard. Um, so um, other questions, you know, we think about uh, solar in the U.S., across the U.S., and then very specific to, to Pennsylvania, we recognize uh, the Pennsylvania is not nearly as good of a spot as another location might be. Uh, but the reality is you can have solar energy in Alaska. Um, it's not as good as maybe in Southern Arizona, uh, but, but it is doable. And we're seeing that solar is finding a place in Pennsylvania. And with the number of projects in the queue, I think that speaks for that. 
Um, another big part of this that we need to keep in mind, and I thought it was interesting, one of the pictures, Katie, that you were showing, uh, that farm showed high uh, voltage power lines in that view. So the infrastructure that's already in place is one of the big drivers, whether it's substations or transmission lines, uh, but a lot of that is already in place and that's attractive to investors as they're thinking about this type of development. I mentioned about the support, I mentioned about the 80,000 acres and investors. Uh, we also wanna keep in mind that a big part of our population and industry, uh, when you look at the nation as a whole, is in the East Coast. Um, so we're close to the market, uh, you have less transmission losses, all those things are in, in that uh, conversation as well. Last slide, promise, um, is that um, what, can, what else can we expect? Uh, pushback. Um, we saw that with the gas side, we see with pipelines, or in power lines, we see it if a new road comes through or a new warehouse wants to be built. Uh, legitimate reasons for pushing back and saying this is not the appropriate use of this particular uh, part of the landscape. Uh, and sometimes maybe not. So again, I'm not advocating for or against, but uh, that is going to be a big part of the dynamic when we see uh, utility scale solar. We're already seeing that at, at political levels and certainly at the community level. So that's something we want to think about. Uh, meaning that just because something is proposed doesn't mean it's going to be built at all, or it might not be built in the, the uh, time frame. So thinking about how to place them uh, thinking about how to work at the township level with ordinances and zoning and, and all those considerations is going to be important. Uh, the demand as we electrify the country, uh, that's going to be important as well. More uh, electric vehicles and other uh, electrification of our heating systems and such, uh, that's going to put bigger demand for electric and again, closer proximity to, uh, to that resource, electrical resource, and the population is going to be a part of the dynamic as well. And then lastly, um, there are two points. Uh, one, the um, uh, other types of resource development, meaning excess renewables, uh, off-peak uh, production of power could go into other types of storage or other types of low carbon or no carbon, meaning uh, possibly green hydrogen as a new resource that can be used and then utilized in other parts of industry, like heavy industry, for instance, or transportation, like heavy trucks. Uh, so, you know, there's different types of considerations as we think about that going forward. And I think that's going to be a big part of the uh, dynamic when we think about uh, placement. And as I mentioned, my colleague is, is also in this call, and that's something we try to get people to think about when they're, when they're working on leases. And then very last point, uh, and then I'll sign out, is the, um, the point about um, you think about these big companies, these big um, oil and gas companies, they're transitioning as well, and they're going to be seen and expected to be energy companies in the future. Uh, some might see them uh, there now, but the reality is they're mostly uh, likely oil and gas companies, uh, but they see their future in, in um, uh, renewables and other parts of the story, and they see themselves as being energy companies in total, and many of them moving very rapidly towards uh, other segments, geothermal and hydrogen and uh, certainly uh, components of, um, of wind and, and sun. So with that, uh, go to the last slide, which is just my contact information. Does anybody like to uh, circle back? Uh, you feel free. The slides, I think Katie's going to make them available. Uh, I thank everybody for the time here. And I think when we're all done, we're going to come back to uh, questions. So uh, I'll be here for that. Uh, with that, thank you. And I'll stop sharing my screen. That's exactly right, Tom. Thank you so much. Sarah, you are up next. And in the meantime, as Sarah's getting set up, I'll just remind folks to submit your questions. Um, please do that via the chat and we'll keep track of them and save them for our Q&A session. Uh, good morning. Did that, did that work? My nice slides? We see that it, we just need it to be in presentation mode. There you go. Perfect. Okay. Great. Well, thanks so much for inviting me. Um, I'd like to give a shout out to all my former colleagues at DCNR um, and partners. Um, I've been a fan of the South Mountain Partnership for many years, and it's, it's exciting to see how it's growing and um, doing so many different things. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about land use and um, solar from the perspective of our membership, of, of which is mostly farmers. So I'll tell you a little bit about PASA first. Um, I'm not sure how I can advance my slides. Sarah, if you 
hover your mouse toward the bottom left corner. Ah. Yeah. That should work. Or use your arrow keys. Ah, well. Oh, somehow, did it start you on your last slide? I think it did. <laughs> okay. I'll so do back to the beginning. It up. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. Great. Um, so that's me, my contact information. Um, this is a little bit about um, PASA. Um, we are a group that's been around for 30 years now. This is our 30th year. Um, we are um, Pennsylvania-based um, Association of Farmers and Changemakers Cultivating environmentally sound, economically viable, and community-focused farms and food systems. We have uh, 75 members here in Pennsylvania. We've got some additional members in neighboring states. And basically, um, most of our members are active farmers. Um, we also have folks who are interested in sustainable food in general. Um, and all of our members support sustainable agriculture, which means two things, um, environmentally responsible farming, but also protecting farmland. And in doing that, um, protecting farms, which means in order to survive, they have to be economically viable. And I mentioned those both aspects of sustainability because solar really plays into that dynamic. Um, we, we kind of have a foot in both camps. Um, one of the first things that um, I asked our executive director, Hannah Smith Brubaker, when I joined PASA about a year and a half ago, what is what, what are you hearing from members? What's a big policy issue for them? And she said, well, I haven't really thought about things in terms of um, policy issues, but I can tell you the number one call that we get is about solar <laughs> energy. So um, while I'm neither a solar developer or a a grazer. Um, I have been talking to both groups for quite a while now. Find out what is our interest. Um, a note about our members. Um, we represent uh, farmers all across the spectrum. We're not just one type of farming operation. Um, while everyone in the group does care about sustainability and practices sustainability. Um, we have um, conventional farmers who farm 200 acres or more, a lot of dairy farmers. We also have folks who are farming designer vegetables on three acres or less. So we run the whole gamut and I imagine that that's pretty well represented in the South Mountain region. So um, again, solar is a big issue for our group. Um, some of the issues that have come up. Um, a lot of times, and I think I heard this echoed a little bit this morning already, um, folks can view solar and agriculture as kind of an either or proposition. Either you have a large utility scale solar array or you have production agriculture. Um, you see this theme echoed in some of the efforts in other surrounding states who are developing siting guidelines. Um, I've been collecting some of these. Um, I think the ones from New Jersey and Maryland are fairly typical. Um, New Jersey's was written by its uh, state um, environmental agency and Maryland's was written by the uh, Chesapeake Conservancy. Um, they're going county by county because um, Maryland is, is just so um, different depending on which county you are, but they have a couple things in common. And in, in both cases, they look at solar as um, not something that should be on farms. Um, they also designate um, forested lands and uh, sensitive ecosystems, wetlands, and other uh, hot spots for biodiversity is essentially no-go zones. You know, do not put solar there for any reason. Um, I think there's a lot of confusion out there, um, partly because, as Tom mentioned a moment ago, the trend right now is towards large-scale, utility-scale solar, um, really large arrays, which for obvious um, efficiency reasons, have much more appeal to the large-scale uh, solar developers who are 
um, approaching farmers. Um, we certainly have a lot of farmers who have been approached. They tend to be near the um, transfer stations and places where they're strategically more valuable. Um, and some of our members have solar arrays on their lands, but I would say the vast majority are in that position of wanting to know more and wondering if it's for them. Um, I will say that the lack of um, having a community solar bill, which I know Doug is going to touch on, um, has a lot of farmers uh, hesitant to make that move. So um, there are some um, great resources out there and there's a lot of solar activity <laughs> in the South Mountain region um, that combines farming and solar. And that's really what I'm here to talk about today. We don't see solar as an either or with farming. We are exploring ways where farmers can do solar in a way that A, works for them and not just the solar company, but also allows the continuation of production agriculture and the siting that is as uh, sustainable as possible. So um, I think uh, Susan Perry had already put in the chat, one of the best resources out there is the American Solar Grazing Association. They're based up in Cornell, New York. Uh, Lexi Hain, who runs that, was actually uh, down here two weeks ago. Um, it, unfortunately, the timing wasn't right or I would have given up my slot for her. She's really a national expert in grazing and um, solar development. And she actually has a solar array on her farm and runs uh, 40 sheep out there. Um, we're seeing more and more of this. A number of our members um, either have solar on their own farms or they graze on um, other solar arrays owned by others. Um, a couple of examples of those, Dickinson College, as many of you have may have seen, has a, has a solar array on campus. And the Dickinson Farm, which is about six miles from there, has a nice flock um, this spring. I think they're up to 50 sheep, which they graze at the Dickinson Array. Um, I think they've just moved them out there. Um, Tom Murphy and I spent a day last fall looking at the array and uh, he's got an amazing 360 uh, camera that can sort of shoot from above. And so we got some great photos of that. It's, the sheep do extremely well um, out there. Uh, they like the shade, they like the grass, um, they even tidy up the weeds. Um, it's a win-win um, and the college gets free mowing um, and actually they uh, end up with the sheep as part of their CSA at the end of the year. Um, so, so it's a mutually beneficial arrangement. Um, I don't know if there's a lease involved in that case. Um, some farmers do actually earn some uh, revenue by providing their sheep as a grazing unit um, and a management option. Some are just happy to have the extra forage and don't get a revenue source. But I think it's an area of interest for our membership. They really would like to see more leasing arrangements that um, pay them for the trouble of transport management and ensuring that the um, grass and weeds are, are managed. Um, Susquehanna University has a large solar array. One of our members, Carolyn Owens, takes her sheep up there during the season and um, has had many years of success there. I was able to uh, visit the Carlisle School District last week at Bel Air Elementary and their middle school across the street. They have a large solar array that um, involves both campuses and a new farmer, um, Ryan Miller and his family who live and work near at a nearby farm are grazing uh, 20 sheep, um, 20 ewes on one side and 20 rams on the other side. Um, and his, his flock is growing He's in discussions with Giant Foods and Nouse Foods in Adams County to spread his sheep around. Um, depending on the size and the condition of the grass, you can 
leave sheep out all season or you can kind of transform, uh, transport them back and forth. There is a lot of management involved. So most farmers feel like they uh, should be making some uh, revenue from this. I will say uh, grazing and solar are not compatible for every livestock species. Um, it absolutely does not work with goats. Um, goats are famous for climbing on things and destroying <laughs> infrastructure, so that experiment has ended badly. Um, we know <laughs> that uh, Cumberland Valley High School had alpacas at some point and they may be coming back. Um, there's renewed interest in grazing poultry and Ryan is going to try that in Pennsylvania at the uh, Carlisle School site in probably starting this summer. New York State has done a lot of poultry grazing um, with solar and that works very well as well. Certain things that um, you have to have on hand, you must have a fence obviously so the livestock don't wander off. You need um, uh, minerals and a water source but other than that it's pretty simple. So um, let's see, so here's a couple photos of course of, of the uh, the stars of the show. Um, on the left is the Dickinson array with the Dickinson farm sheep. Um, the guy in the foreground with the harness is, is the male and the rest are ewes. Um, and the uh, solar array on the right is Ryan Miller's setup at Bel Air Elementary School in Carlisle. This is a group of rams. These are hairless um, sheep. They're really interesting breed. Um, and th again, they love the shade, uh, they keep the grass really, really well mowed and um, are generally pretty self-sufficient, but um, it does require some management. So um, again, there's a variety of leases out there, they differ a lot. Um, I think like any farmer, they want to have a lease that gives them more of a say. I think one of the complaints that we hear right now with the large scale utility solar is farmers that we've talked to view it a little bit like having uh, gas pads on their um, properties. They don't have a lot of rights. They don't have a lot of say on where things go. Um, they would like a little bit more control of the uses and management of the site. Um, and in general, uh, not all farmers have a singular view on this, but there seems to be a lot of interest in smaller scale community sized solar that works with the farm and doesn't displace, um, again, anything that the farm is currently doing. Um, so as I mentioned before, there is a trade off. Um, you know, the farmers get the extra grazing land on a solar array. Um, the landowner, if it's off site, gets free uh, mowing and weed control. Um, and I think I've covered most of those points. So um, there's a whole field of solar and agriculture that doesn't involve grazing and it's largely experimental. There's a lot of demonstrations going on across the country and across the globe. And I thought I would mention just a few because it's exciting and it offers more potential to combine solar and agriculture in a way that works for the farmer and um, continues to provide food security. I think we all saw with the pandemic how important it is to keep um, farmers farming, to keep uh, land in agriculture, um, to have it available locally. Uh, we saw breaks in the food supply chain that I think scared everyone. So we're very, very interested in finding these win-wins where you can continue to farm with solar. This is um, a solar array from Lyon in France where they're growing grapes. Um, this is a vineyard um, and they have uh, movable uh, panels that can actually deflect things like hail and protect the crop from damage. Um, it can also adjust sunlight, uh, shade, and um, it's kind of remarkable. We're hearing uh, this coming from the Netherlands and other places in Europe. Um, it's a whole collection of um, activities under the title of agrivoltaics, and these specially designed panels are not cheap, but um, 
it would be really exciting to see them here in Pennsylvania, especially since we see uh, the expansion of wineries here in the state. So um, just a couple lessons that we're hearing from some of these studies. Um, the results are good. Um, the panels um, create um, much lower evapotranspiration rates, so you can grow some of these crops with less water, saving water and um, money for the grower. The panels can be moved. Um, it, the panels also mitigate against drought and heat loss, which is important as the climate continues to heat up and change. Um, some of the folks that are doing this are reporting a market advantage, and that's important to our growers. What they're finding is that the shading will have the effect of uh, slowing the ripening of grapes. And so when everybody else is sold out of grapes, their grapes go on the market and can fetch a higher price. So that's been an interesting and unpredicted um, kind of added benefit of this. Um, I will say in full disclosure that these uh, electronically um, controlled solar panels can be quite expensive. So the startup costs would obviously need to be uh, supported and subsidized, probably beyond what is available at the moment. Um, this is an array at the University of Arizona, which is one of the leading universities in terms of solar research right now. Um, again, as others have mentioned, they have the climate, um, but they're doing some really interesting things in our view with vegetables and grains. So, you know, it, it's, it's sheep grazing is still relatively um, limited in Pennsylvania. It's growing, but it's not the dominant agricultural uh, means of production by any means. So if we're really going to expand uh, this kind of compatible wind-wind solar and agriculture, we're going to have to make sure that solar panels work with other types of production. These are tomatoes, peppers, um, all kinds of things that they're finding they are growing quite successfully. And again, uh, shading being part of the solution here. Um, they had um, double the production of tomatoes that they had in unprotected, unsolared fields. Um, herbs do very, very well under solar panels. They're using less water. Again, implications not only for the plants, but for farm workers who are um, something that PASA really um, spends a lot of time uh, working on uh, as, as you know, climate change um, it, it gets more advanced. We're, we're seeing impacts to our farm workers, um, more heat stress, um, more deaths. So anything that can help mitigate that um, is very important to us. Um, many people may not realize, but 25% of the farms in Pennsylvania use farm workers um, uh, from other countries. So um, I know Doug's going to cover this community solar bill, so I won't go into that other than to say that our members strongly support the bill. Um, I think we need a citing guidance for Pennsylvania that doesn't necessarily automatically rule out all farmland, but puts some parameters on it. When is it appropriate? How is it appropriate? What we can, what can we do to make it compatible? Um, I think this in turn will take some of the pressure off of forest lands and ecologically sensitive lands. Um, agriculture is obviously a great target for utility scale solar, but um, again, um, so, so are other uh, conservation lands that arguably um, should have a higher level of protection. I don't think I would quibble with the Maryland or the New Jersey guidance to put forest land off uh, limits entirely and um, ecologically sensitive lands. But again, I think agriculture provides an opportunity to combine um, with precautions. Um, I think we need to uh, make sure that Reggie is adopted. There is some uh, draft language there that would make some of the offset dollars available to uh, support solar. Um, so we would love to see that. And again, the final thought here is 
to make sure that farmers are an equal player in this field and have more say in what is done and not just offer them, you know, our way or the highway, which is kind of the system that we've seen at this point. So um, I'll stick around for questions as well and hand it back to Katie. Thanks. Thanks so much, Sarah. Okay, rounding out our presentation is Doug. Doug, it's your turn to share your screen. And we are almost right on time, so take it away. Thank you, Katie. It's great to be here. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to the group. And I particularly appreciate a whole group of speakers who have spoken before me, who have laid the uh, laid all of the groundwork for the conversation that I want to have with you. Uh, I am Doug Nydick. I'm with Greenworks Development. I'm partnered with a company called Solar Renewable Energy. We're both in the Mechanicsburg, Harrisburg area. Uh, we are, I think, the largest Pennsylvania-based solar developer at this point. Uh, we do lots of solar over, all over the Mid-Atlantic. A lot of that solar is in Pennsylvania. Uh, most of the work that we do is for not-for-profits, and that's coincidental. We do a lot of work for schools. We do a lot of work for municipalities. Uh, we do a lot of work for not-for-profits in general. Uh, we also do work for commercial businesses as well. Uh, but all the work that we do is what's called distributed generation solar, and that's solar that we develop specifically for end users on their sites, and I'll talk about that in a sec. I'm not gonna bore you with all kinds of details here, but I felt it was worthwhile to put a quick slide in place that just talks about how solar works. I really wanna spend most of my time talking about the different applications for solar and really kind of addressing a lot of the issues and questions and things that we've already discussed this morning. Uh, but solar works pretty simply. This stuff's been around, the first commercial solar panel was sold in 1954, so that means solar's older than I am. Um, First commercial panel was introduced at about $1,000 a watt in 1954. We're buying panels now for about 35 cents a watt. Uh, we buy them all over the Pacific Rim. We typically don't buy Chinese panels any longer because of tariff issues. We buy panels from Vietnam and Malaysia and Singapore and other places. Unfortunately, they're labor intensive buggers to make. So a lot of these things come in from the Pacific Rim. Uh, but a solar panel is a solid state device. Uh, lots and lots and lots of recycle, recyclable materials in these guys. Uh, actually, almost everything in here is recyclable, except for a little bit of plastic insulation. Uh, it's glass, it's metals, you know, particularly aluminum. Uh, it's copper wiring. It is uh, all, it's silicon. <clears throat> it's all things that can be returned into the manufacturing stream. Uh, solar is a solid state device. It's a, you know, the, the semiconductor material that's the same semiconductor material that is the magic in your cell phone uh, is the magic that turns photons of sunlight into electrons that are electricity. Uh, that semiconductor material doesn't have to move in order to generate electricity. That means that these things are really reliable. So the panels we put up, we only use tier one suppliers panels. Uh, and those at this point all come with a 30 year power production warranty, which means that if you don't get 80% of the rated output of a panel over a 30 year period, the manufacturer will replace that panel free of cost. And of the well over a million panels that we've installed in the last 12 years or so, uh, we've replaced six. And I think all of those six were because a, uh, a lawnmower threw a rock at a panel and panels aren't designed to manage that uh, couple of pound rock coming at it. So there, it's a very reliable system. You array the panels on a roof or on the ground or on a parking canopy or on water. I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, you run wiring down into an inverter that turns DC power that the panels generate into AC that you can use in a building. Uh, you run that electricity through a bi-directional meter that runs either forward or backward, depending on whether you're generating power that you can't use right then and you're pushing that to the grid, which becomes your battery or you're at, at night or when it's cloudy or when there's a blizzard, you're bringing power in from the grid, the meter will run in a conventional direction. Uh, I, I don't wanna spend a lot of time on this, but solar works financially two ways. There's a 26% federal tax credit, 87% bonus depreciation for 
entities, including individuals that have tax credit uh, that can absorb this credit that's available for solar. When you generate solar, you get the tax credit, you'll get the bonus depreciation. You also generate electricity savings. Here's a ballpark of the kind of offset we're able to do in Pennsylvania. <clears throat> and significantly too, you generate what's called solar renewable energy certificates or SRECs for every megawatt hour of solar that you produce in Pennsylvania, you're given one SREC and those SRECs are traded, traded on a market and we manage all that stuff for our clients. Uh, they're traded on a market where you can buy and sell them. The state creates the market by requiring a certain percentage of solar be produced by its utilities in Pennsylvania. And right now uh, we're at 8%, uh, half a percent of that is distributed generation solar. We're trying to push that higher. We're trying to push distributed generation solar in Pennsylvania at this point to two and a half percent, which is going from about nothing to a very small amount, but that's still an uphill battle. Uh, that requirement that Pennsylvania mandates sets the price for solar for these SRECs. Uh, currently, SRECs are at about three and a half to four cents per kilowatt hours worth of value. Uh, if we can get, if Pennsylvania law currently requires half a percent solar, that's where the value is given that half percent. We are actively engaged in a legislative effort to get that half a percent move to two and a half percent. We think that'll take SREC values up into the 75 to $100 per certificate range, which is seven and a half to 10 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, bookmark that because that's going to enable a lot of the other applications for solar in Pennsylvania that I want to talk to you about. A couple of things randomly to know about solar. Uh, the first one is up in the yellow box. Every hour, the amount of energy that hits the earth from the sun is about the same as the planet uses in a year. Every hour, by the time we're done here, there will have been twice as much energy that hit the planet as the entire planet's gonna use in a year. That's remarkable to me. Uh, we are squandering our grandchildren's futures because we are not politically willing to harness that absolutely abundant amount of energy. Um, down the lower left, if we could cover less than half the available roof and parking lot space in the US, we'd power the whole country. Uh, that's all of what we've been talking about this morning so far is how do we not put solar all over Pennsylvania's farmland? How do we put that in other places so that it becomes more synergistic with our use and it becomes friendlier to cohabiting with farmland in the first place? Uh, there's the answer is you cover roofs, you cover parking lot space. And if you could put enough incentives behind solar, you can start to do the kinds of things that Sarah just showed you and put the array over the, you know, the, the agricultural use uh, and make it uh, better for agriculture than if uh, you didn't have the solar there. That's all about incentives for solar. And it's all about taking the price of what I call irrational energy, which is fossil fuel based energy, uh, getting it up to where it should be to reflect the cost to the environment and the cost to society and the cost to our grandkids. Uh, the, the Blue Oval says that the best way to save money, the, the, the way to save the most money on solar is to first have it put up efficiently. You have to make sure that you're careful about how you have, have it put up, especially if you're a homeowner, because there's a lot of wheeler dealers out there around solar because it's a relatively new industry segment. Uh, first, you have to put it up efficiently. And second, the best way to make and save money on solar is to own it yourself as quickly as possible. Uh, it is an absolute truism in the industry that you wanna control your own energy future, whether you're a school, whether you're a homeowner, whether you're a business, uh, whether you're a municipality, whether you're a farm, uh, one of the things that you wanna try to do is control your own energy future. And the way to do that is to do what's called distributed generation solar and have the energy generating plant, the solar plant, put up on your location where you're using the energy. So here's the types of solar development that we've been talking about all morning. And again, I thank the speakers before me for laying the groundwork here. Uh, distributed generation solar is the solar that I was just talking about a second ago. Uh, that's solar that we as Greenworks Development Solar Renewable Energy exclusively do. We're not a utility scale 
developer, we're a distributed generation solar developer. So we develop solar for schools, we develop solar for municipalities. I'll show you some examples in a sec. We develop solar for businesses behind the meter, what's called behind the meter, which means behind their electric meter, we'll put up their own generating system for them behind their electric meter so that they save money on electricity themselves so that they generate their own renewable energy certificates, those SRECs that we talk about, talked about, and they sell them and they get that income and they basically control their own energy futures. That's a big deal. And in almost every case for businesses and homeowners and schools and all the other entities that I've been talking about, uh, almost any of these entities have the capability to control their own energy futures. That's a big deal. Utility scale solar is the kind of solar that Tom was talking about a couple of minutes ago. Lots of uh, activity in Pennsylvania at this point. I understand the, the value of solar and renewables and you know, I'm not an anti-utility scale solar sort, uh, but I am a wildly pro distributed generation solar player here. Uh, I really think that if we are intelligent about this in the middle of our energy transition and the whole country or the whole planet and the whole country is in the middle of an or on the front end of an energy transition, um, and we're in a situation that fascinates me, especially as an engineer, uh, because we've got the tools to be able to fix this. And energy is a big part of the problem that we're facing right now. And energy, if we don't do it responsibly, could really take uh, us in a different direction in terms of our grandkids' futures. Uh, we are living in a period right now in which we've got the tools to fix this. And really all we lack is the political will. And that is the energy war that we're in the middle of right now. So these kind of conversations with groups like yours this morning really, really interest me in sharing this kind of information. So I'm okay with utility scale solar, but I honestly think that if we did our job well, there's lots better ways to do this in terms of distributed generation. And that's what I'm gonna talk a lot more about in a little bit. Uh, kind of the, the bridge between utility scale and distributed generation solar is the last thing on the list here is community solar that Sarah mentioned a couple minutes ago. Utility scale solar is big utility scale, grid scale developments that are done and connected directly to the grid because solar's the cheapest way to produce electricity now over most of the planet's surface. Uh, that's not a bad thing, but it can take up acres and acres and acres and acres of farmland. Uh, and it leaves energy, the control of energy in the hands of energy companies. And one of Tom's slides mentioned that there's going, going to be new renewable exons in the future because large scale utility scale solar developers will inevitably become the next exons and, and you know, BPs. Uh, that's got its own downside to me because that doesn't leave our energy futures in the hands of the population. Uh, Commissioner Thiel, when he was doing his talk said that our forefathers determined that they wanted the power in the wanted power in the hands of local residents. And I think he was talking politically, but I think there's a little or literal argument there as well, that we really do need the power in the hands of our residents, literally, in terms of our generation capacity. And that's what distributed generation solar is all about. Um, that's what I want to talk more about in a little bit. Community solar is solar that in Pennsylvania, the way that the legislation that Sarah mentioned a couple of minutes ago is drafted currently, and it's not enacted yet, it's a war. Uh, the way the legislation's drafted community solar means that if you develop a 20 acre solar farm, that would be a five megawatt farm, the way that the legislation enables everything, you basically as a smaller scale development or developer, and we, we would do this kind of solar ourselves if this legislation falls into place, uh, you can put up a 20 acre, five megawatt farm. That's a fair amount of generation. Uh, you put it up on, let's say 20 of the least usable acres of a couple hundred acre farmer's field. Uh, the way that we've drafted our term sheet around community solar is that we would, if a farmer were interested, uh, suggest to that farmer that we'd be willing to lease 20 acres of that farm uh, at about two to three times what a typical farmer is able to generate profit-wise, depending on the crop, 
uh, profit wise to generate from his farm. Uh, we'll pay two to three times that for the lease, the ability to use 20 acres of a farm, not the whole farm, but 20 acres of a farm. And if it's a south facing, maybe a little bit sloped, not as ideal for farming, maybe some rocks there that the farmer would rather not deal with, maybe some other issues that don't work well in terms of drainage and such. Uh, we'll take those 20 acres, not the prime 20 acres, but those 20 acres, develop a community solar array on that 20 acres, help the farmer stay sustainable because we're gonna pay him two to three times or her two to three times what they would make on farming that land in the first place. And we'll take their least productive land and we'll set it up so that we develop that array and then we'll go out and find subscribers. And if the farmer is a, if the farm is a farm that uses a fair amount of energy, let's say they've got greenhouses, let's say they've got a uh, lot of automation in the farm, let's say they're doing a lot of milking and they're a dairy farm and they're using a lot of electricity, uh, maybe they're one of our subscribers and we'll subscribe to, to with them so that they can buy electricity from that community solar array at a discount below conventional, what I call irrational energy. Uh, so we'll sell them electricity at a discount and then we'll be able to go out and find other subscribers anywhere within the utility uh, footprint. So a PPL footprint or a MedEd footprint or a PICO footprint or whatever utility footprint we're dealing in, uh, the legislation as it's currently drafted means we go out and find commercial and residential subscribers for that green electricity and create kind of a hybrid between a utility scale array that's going to be owned by a larger utility company uh, and distributed generation that's going to be owned by the user directly themselves. Uh, lots of detail obviously involved in this that I can't cover in this kind of time frame, uh, but if you've got questions here, let me know. We talk about a couple of projects because I, th I think bringing this down to the ground and talking about specific projects is a good way to bring this home. So these projects that I'm going to talk to you about are all distributed generation projects. They're the first of the three types of solar that I showed you on the previous slide. Here's an array that we just finished last November for the Tamaqua School District uh, up in Tamaqua, PA. If you look at a map of coal country, Tamaqua is right in the middle of that map that you'd have in your hands. Uh, so the array that you see right above Tamaqua Elementary there is an array, it's a seven acre array, two and a half megawatts that supplies 100% of the district's electricity. And that array is located on an abandoned coal strip mine. And that was abandoned desert land. It looked that that desert looking area up there, up at the top of the slide where the solar array is located, looked just like that when we got there. It was not starting to reforest at all. It had been damaged enough that it wasn't regenerating. Uh, we basically went in, drove posts into the ground, put the uh, panels on those posts, put the inverters in, and we're supplying 100% of the energy for the school district. In this case, the Tamaqua School District, once they buy the array, and I don't have time to get into the whole structure, but they're not gonna have to put any money into the array for non, not-for-profit structures like schools, and municipalities and other not-for-profit entities, hospitals and such. Uh, we, as a CPA-driven company, put a structure together in which we put a special purpose entity in place that's comprised of investors who have federal tax liability. And that special purpose entity will purchase all the materials, install the array, operate, own, and maintain the array for an initial five-year period. And they've got to hold the array for five years so that they qualify for that 26% federal tax credit that I talked to you about. So there's no cost to the school because the investors buy the array and install it and operate it. The school pays a monthly service fee basically for the use of the array. But while they pay that service fee, the school saves all the money on their electricity, everything that we can offset via solar. And the school also takes all of the value of those SRECs, those renewable energy certificates that we talked about earlier. In Tamaqua's case, for the first couple of years, for the first five years, they're going to save about eighty thousand dollars a year after they buy their the array, and they can hundred percent finance the array after five years, so they don't need to come out of pocket with any cost there at, at all either. Uh, they're going to save about one hundred and fifty or two hundred thousand dollars a year on their own generating plant. When Ray Kinder, who's the superintendent of Tamaqua, 
was looking at his cash flow statement when I first was talking to him about the possibility of doing an array. And he looked at his savings numbers. He looked at it for about two minutes and finally looked up over the top of the page to me and said, this means I can do full day kindergarten. And I said, Ray, that's exactly what I wanted you to say. That's exactly the kind of use for money like this that I think we ought to be having done. Uh, Ray also has this array engaged in his science classes with his kids. They are learning about energy by virtue of the data that are coming in every 15 minutes from the array, the renewable array, the rational energy array that's producing 100% of the electricity for his district. Uh, that's a great application for solar and that's not tearing up farmland, that is putting solar on an abandoned strip mine and 100% powering a school where it belongs. This is an array Hey, Doug, just, yeah. just wanted to um, give everyone an update. We, um, we are running a few minutes behind. I know you have a few more slides, but I really want to make sure that everyone gets a chance to Thanks, ask Nancy. you all some really great questions. They've been trickling in. Um, so just wanted to let you know that. Got it. You got it. I'll move a little more quickly. This is an array we just finished last year at the Pottsville School District as well, also in coal country. In this case, they didn't have the land available, uh, but they had new roofs on their buildings. So we put a, uh, an array that does about 50% of their electricity on the roofs of all of their buildings. Worked out really, really well. Uh, here's parking canopy solar. There were questions that I saw on the chat screen about parking canopy solar. The problem we've got here is that our, our, our cost of electricity in Pennsylvania is around uh, seven cents per kilowatt hour, and we can offset five and a half to six, six cents of that typically. I need to get, and our incentives are at three and a half to four cents on SREX. We need to get the cost of electricity up. Uh, in Pennsylvania, it's about half the cost of most neighboring states. Uh, we need to get our incentives up in Pennsylvania, up into that seven and a half to 10 cents per kilowatt hour range. When we do that, I can do parking canopy solar and cover parking lots all over the, the Commonwealth. Uh, it is basically an incentive and cost of conventional electricity problem. But those kinds of parking canopies are phenomenal. I'm doing them in Jersey all day long. I won't bore you with all the details, but here again in New Jersey, where the incentives are stronger, the cost of electricity is higher is an 11 acre 4.4 megawatt floating array that we did for the Sayreville Borough Water Authority. Uh, basically, they've got a man-made lake that they built years ago. They uh, recognized the opportunity to float solar on that lake and generate electricity for the borough. Uh, that's what we did. This is the largest floating array in the US. We're working on one right now that's twice this size in New Jersey. That'll be the largest floating array in the world. Here's a pollinator friendly solar array. Here are the solar sheep up at Susquehanna University. This is my head solar sheep, Bob, right here. Uh, I, I don't have time to talk about the details, but we are investigating using a pollinator instead of a turf grass, especially perimeter to our solar arrays that will, while we're putting these in community solar applications on farms, uh, could help to pollinate the farm because of the fact that these are pollinator attractors uh, while it helps to conserve the farmland in the first place. Here's, here's my house. I'm sitting, uh, sitting right back here right now. Uh, this is my house. There's the 11 and a half megawatt or 11.3 kilowatt solar array that I've got on the roof. This is distributed generation solar because solar for homeowners, I'm a homeowner, solar for homeowners is distributed generation behind the meter solar. Uh, my electric car sits in the garage this solar array on my roof powers about 80% of my 3,500 square foot house and my electric car that sits in the garage. Uh, if I were to use the latest generation of residential panels that just came out that are higher output, I'd power the entire house and garage. There's contact information. I've probably taken a little too long here, Katie. Sorry about that, but uh, it has been great to share the information with you. Thank you, Doug. We always make it challenging for our presenters because yeah. we like to cram a lot into a short amount of time. And that's even more true as we've condensed our agendas to go virtual. But again, this is um, what we think will be the first of many uh, events into which we dig into the details around solar energy development. But uh, yeah, it's time to move into our Q&A session so Doug, if you could stop your screen share 
And if I could ask Tom to turn on his video, we will start our Q&A. So folks, if you haven't submitted a question, uh, please feel free to do so through the chat function below. Um, I am going to put a plug in, as you're submitting your questions, I'm going to plug an event shared to us by the Penn State Agricultural Law Center. Uh, they will be putting on, in conjunction with Penn State Extension, the Penn State Solar Law Symposium on June, excuse me, June 15th and 17th. Um, it will be online and each day will cover utility scale solar development. Um, I will share those details with you in a follow-up email and I believe um, one of Thomas's colleagues has already shared it in the chat, but we'll make sure that that follow-up email presents that information to you as well. So let's get started. Um, we have about 15 questions submitted so far. I'm going to start off with just a few uh, that are, are pretty specific to our region. Um, one, one of the good ones I think is, is about addressing site, siting considerations. Um, and this person is interested in how you guys would approach working with developers to install um, solar arrays in new developments, um, specifically warehouses and warehouse projects. And um, where do we go in the future for those types of information resources? Where do you go for information about well, it was sort of a two-part question. Sure. What recommendations would you have for us approaching developers on siting considerations? How do we work with developers to install in new warehouse development? That was the first part. Second part being, where do we go for even more information or precedents or case studies about that? I can address that one, Katie, if you'd like me to. So the paradox in terms of warehouse solar is that warehouses, lots of warehouses in this area, because all the highways come together in this area, warehouses have big old flat, mostly empty roofs. The paradox is that unless you're dealing with a refrigerated warehouse or a warehouse where there's a lot of automation, uh, you don't have a lot of electricity use in uncooled, unheated, unautomated warehouses. And that's a lot of what we've got in this area. Uh, that begs, that, that absolutely begs for community solar legislation to be enacted because that 20 acre, five megawatt community solar array that I talked about a little while ago and that Sarah talked about, that's an array that'll fit fairly comfortably on a million square foot warehouse roof that Pennsylvania is building a ton of at this point. The problem is that right now with our current legislation, if I can't use the energy that's coming off that five megawatt array on, the, on an unheated an uncooled warehouse roof, if I can't use the electricity in the building, uh, I can't sell it. And I need community solar legislation in order to be able to make a financially viable project out of that. But warehouse roofs are ideal for community mm -hmm. solar. And let's say that that legislation was enacted. What would need to already be in place at the local level, at the county or municipal level to jump right into something like that? I don't think much. Yeah, basically, we're, we deal county by county, township by count, township with local ordinances and local rules and regs around these sorts of things. Uh, and mainly those get down to the array itself, not the structure of the project, but the structure of the technology, if you will. Uh, so there are some issues. Frankly, there's lots less issues now than there were 10 years ago, because I think uh, everyone is starting to become accustomed and comfortable and familiar with solar. So I don't perceive any new ordinances that we'd have to deal with with community solar that we don't deal with already just in putting solar up in the first place. If I could add to that, um, a lot of those warehouses, which are absolutely ideal spots to add solar 
back up to farmland <laughs> almost <laughs> always. And I think um, with, with community solar, you could create neighborhoods, if you will, of, of neighbors um, and allow those farmers to be able to use the electricity generated from those warehouse solar roofs um, without a lot of infrastructure because they're right next door and then they wouldn't have to give up an acre of their own productive farmland. Really does make enormous sense. Um, and, and it varies, not all farms need a tremendous amount of electricity, but DEP did a study fairly recently and dairies use quite a bit. Um, there's a lot of hoop house kind of covered um, vegetable production going on that uses a lot. And there's a growing poultry sector that also uses a lot of electricity for the fans and the heat. So having that amount would just be perfect for an awful lot of different farm operations. Hey, I, I also weigh in here as well, maybe make two points, one technical and, and one um, uh, maybe more uh, policy or ordinance related. Uh, starting with the ordinance piece and uh, kind of dovetailing in with a comment that Doug was making a moment ago. Um, in municipalities or counties where there are ordinances, solar ordinances in place, and we we're doing a lot of research across the state on what those ordinances look like and then trying to convey that ordinance information out uh, to municipalities, including in Adams County that are interested in that. Um, we're finding out that the uh, many county or many, uh, we'll say, governing bodies out there, local governing bodies uh, with, uh, across the state, don't have an ordinance in place. So they're trying to sort that out. So having uh, ordinance language that allows for this uh, could be helpful in pushing it forward on buildings or in some of these other uh, locations that we're talking about other than uh, flat farmland. So ordinance language or a better understanding in that regard is helpful. The other thing is uh, from a technical standpoint on rooftops, um, you know, there is monofacial panels and bifacial panels. I don't remember that I heard Doug uh, mention that, but you know, different types of panels or different type of technology will say can be more efficient or less efficient uh, in different types of applications. And a bifacial panel picking up on reflection off of a more highly reflective uh, rooftop uh, could add to the mix as well. So again, it could be one more way to create more efficiencies and, and create more opportunity as you think about the application of, of uh, uh, solar in this case, distributed solar in that case, or community. That's so interesting, you guys. I have a, a f another follow-up question. We had someone chime in saying, I don't understand why community solar isn't currently permitted what is the legislation that is needed? So can you be a bit more specific? I think uh, many of us are, are just getting up to speed about the legislation that would allow this to um, proliferate. Sarah, you had the new bill, the new community solar bill in your slide deck. Do you have that number? Yeah, it's Senate Bill 472. I was just about to put it in the chat and I was hoping that Doug, perhaps you would give the why as to why it's not moving. Well, you know, the, the why is because we're in the middle of the energy wars, right? It's the same reason why we don't have a half a percent distributed generation solar bumped up to two and a half percent of Pennsylvania's overall generation. Uh, it's because when I talk to, and I don't want to get too political about this, but when I talk to Republican state legislators about either of these bills, uh, what I hear is that gas is clean energy, which it's not and that Pennsylvania is a gas state, so we're good. So why would we want to go to renewables? And renewables use child labor and all kinds of other thin reasons why you don't want to use renewables. It's ridiculous. Uh, it is, we're in the middle of the energy wars, and it is absolutely just political will. But the problem is that almost every neighbor, neighboring state around us, except Ohio, which is also a gas state, uh, is moving way, way, way down path in front of us in terms of their renewable platforms. And renewables, renewable infrastructure is very similar to transportation infrastructure to me. If you don't have a good renewable infrastructure and energy infrastructure in the next couple of years, we're not going to be competitive as a state. That's a problem. Thanks for that. So Sarah, you did share the, uh, the Senate bill number in the, in the chat. And so I would encourage folks to uh, look into that uh, further and maybe that's something we can, um, can dive deeper into in another event. 
So um, one of our questions was about the solar parking lots. Doug, you covered that. Um, another question submitted, does Pennsylvania, it sounds like Pennsylvania doesn't have siting guidelines for um, solar development, at least large scale solar development. And um, if that's the case, what agency or agencies are responsible for developing that? And you know, how should we as a region be involved in that, the development of those siting guidelines? Um, I'll take a stab at this and I'll hope that Tom may chime in as well. Um, I'm not aware of a statewide guidance. I think there are probably municipal and township level guidances. Um, that you know govern individual areas. Um, I think um, New Jersey and Maryland are different governmental structures. They're sort of more county led. So I think it's easier for them to compile something at the state level. Um, I, I did mention that I, I thought it would be useful, um, particularly if it were uh, kind of able to look at both sides of the issue and, and provide some practical guidance um, because we don't have, you know, state control over this. Um, it could be nothing more than a guidance. And, um, you know, in Maryland, it was Chesapeake Conservancy, a nonprofit that jumped in and did this. In the New England states, American Farmland Trust is developing a whole series of guidances for those six states. Um, I, I think it would be useful um, whether it comes from academia or a, a nonprofit or, you know, DCNR or DEP and Department of Agriculture. Um, I, I just think that people are looking for some sort of ways to think about this. Um, they're asking a lot of questions and I think it would help. Yeah, and I like how you suggested that multiple agencies be involved in the development of that siting um, criteria because I, mean, I think we're all familiar with the approach here in the South Mountain Partnership that we see all of that woven together on the landscape, the ag, the natural resources, the recreational resources. And so um, it makes sense that a lot of those agencies and stakeholders would be involved in that process, not just one state agency to reach the balance that seems to be needed. Andy, I, I would chime in there as well, uh, real quick, and tell you I, I uh, provided some testimony for a uh, joint uh, Senate hearing just uh, two days ago, I guess. And there was a lot of follow up questions in there about uh, land use, we'll say, and siting is part of that, certainly. Uh, done a number of other sessions for legislators. We have a number of other upcoming uh, conversations in that same realm, and a lot of those go to land use and, and siting issues. Um, but that said, as Sarah mentioned, it's not, a, it's not determined uh, at a state level in the state of Pennsylvania. If you go to New York, there is uh, ownership of siting for renewable type facilities with a local voice, but at the state level. If you go to Ohio, you see similar things. Other states have some similar scenarios. Um, states beyond that, not so much more like what it is in Pennsylvania. So the point is, it's kind of a mixed bag. We are doing some work here um, within Pennsylvania in the central region, actually just north of Harrisburg, with a variety of farmers uh, on a grant that we have looking at siting on one type of land versus another, meaning uh, prime land versus uh, more marginal lands. And I think Doug was mentioning some things about that and Sarah as well. So we're doing some of that work in trying to help farmers to better understand what this would mean to their bottom line on their farm and placement of solar. And then we'll be using those examples and some of the financial and um, uh, yield data and some of the other things we'll glean from that uh, with other groups of, of landowners as they're trying to make these decisions. It's the point in all that, you sum it all up, land use and placement of, of solar and renewables. It's really more than just solar, but in this case, uh, uh, you know, that's our theme. Uh, that's a very hot topic and will continue to be a hot topic at all levels of government and within uh, communities across the state. No question about it. Thanks, Tom. So just to drive the point home, you know, in a hypothetical situation, um, 
you know, ideal situation, Pennsylvania would develop site, like at a state level, site recommendations. But then as Tom keeps pointing out and what we need to pay attention to as a region is that um, only if those recommendations are implemented, you know, seen as valuable and implemented at the local and municipal level, would they, you know, serve to um, create true balance on the local landscape. So um, I guess I'm looking for maybe some uh, words of encouragement or ways you guys would sort of prime us for how we might approach that as a, as a community. Let's say, you know, there are some state guidelines that come out. Um, what's the best way to approach municipalities and as you know, solution builders, as people who, who want to support and, and contribute. You know, in my mind, the public has to get way, way, way more vocal about energy issues and sustainability issues in general. Uh, you know, I, I think we've, we've come, uh, become accustomed as a society to letting the energy companies and politicians take care of all that energy stuff. And it kind of hasn't been really in our face in the past. Uh, over the last 10 years or more, it, it's in our face. And, and over the next 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 years, it's going to really be in our face. And one of the things that I've seen in solar development over the last number of years is that you know every now and then we'll run into that really tough politician or really tough local administrator uh, who is just bound and determined that the world's not going to change. And those public officials very, very rarely hear from their constituents on these sorts of issues. And I, that, that is hugely important at this point, especially with some of the solar legislation that we're trying to push over the top, that the public becomes very vocal about this and very involved. And when I listen to surveys, everyone's in favor of renewables, uh, even in Pennsylvania, but you couldn't tell it by the politics and that disjoint needs to uh, come around. Yeah, Katie, I, I would turn to you guys and say, you know, you're a regional organization, very well networked. You have the trust and uh, collaboration experience with a lot of your townships and cities. Um, you know, that's what a conservation landscape is all about. Um, just what you're doing is the right path. Having these conversations, continuing them, pulling everybody into them. Maybe you guys can create the first regional solar siting, um, you know, for the South Mountain area that can become the model for the whole state. So I would say just keep doing what you're doing because uh, we need more of these conversations. Thanks so much, Sarah. Well, hey, uh I I, I would mention as well, real quick, because I, I think it applies here. This is, and it, it really goes to what both uh, Sarah and Doug are saying, and that's education. Uh, we find that in, in so many different things that we do. Uh, we put together several virtual uh, tours that people can see with, you know, virtual reality headsets, or we do by Zoom. I did one just prior to this particular session. I'll be doing one in another hour, actually, for Cum uh, uh, Cumberland County attorneys. And what is it helps people to understand what does this look like and then make good decisions about that, whether it's a policy that they want to keep going forward with, to Doug's point about, uh, you know, uh, politicians need to better understand it and we're, you know, we're working with them as well, all stakeholders. Uh, but the reality is most people don't know what this looks like. Um, so we're trying to bring people together around that, not advocating, we're educating. And we've read about 3,000 people through those virtual tours. So people then have a much better appreciation or the different bits and pieces and, and how they can coordinate and how it might work or not work within their respective communities. So uh, that's a resource that we're making available and we archive all that. So, you know, members of this particular group and others could come to it uh, or we could schedule something like that if there was ongoing interest. Okay, that sounds wonderful. Like great possible uh, follow-up activities. Well, I know it seems like we just got the discussion started, but we are already over and we have one more agenda segment. So um, once again, thank you, thank you, thank you to our amazing speakers. Thank you for bringing your expertise to the South Mountain region. Um, we really appreciate you and your time. And this probably won't be the last time that we ask you to speak to us. So um, it's not goodbye, it's until next time. 
Uh, next up, we want to introduce you to um, the new manager at Pine Grove Furnace State Park. And as he's coming on board, I'm also going to ask you to respond to one of our poll questions. And that this will inform how the South Mountain Partnership approaches solar development um, information events in the future. We wanna know what information do you need now or what information do you need next after today's event? Um, think about what your community might need, your municipality might need, what your county might need, um, and what future content should the South Mountain Partnership make available to you, your community, and this region? So just uh, respond via the chat. And I'm going to hand the floor over to Chris. And Chris, feel free to share. Oh, no, wait, you are just, you're on video. We don't have a presentation for you. That's right. No, I, uh, I, I don't have any presentation, no uh, fancy slides. All you get is me. Um, hopefully that's enough for everybody. Uh, yeah, um, you know, I don't have anything specific to talk about. I really didn't even prepare a speech or anything. I just kind of want to come out, introduce myself, and say thank you for letting me be a part of this partnership. I really appreciate it. Uh, great, great collaboration efforts here. Um, so yeah, just a little bit about myself. I am the park manager at Pine Grove Furnace State Park. Uh, a little bit about my background. I grew up in State College, so still central Pennsylvania, just a little bit further north. Uh, grew up hunting, fishing, hiking, camping with my dad, really that young age, earliest memories. Um, as I grew up, you know, got a driver's license and I learned every single road and nook and cranny of Rock Rock State Forest uh, up through college. And in college, I just kind of fell into recreation park management um, at Penn State. I, I didn't even know it was a thing. I took a Leisure Studies 101 class as a gen ed. It sounded like Leisure. Hey, this, this, I got to get an A, right? Um, turns out it was a whole major. And with the name park management in it, your opportunities are limited. So I became a park manager. Um, I actually started, I, my first experiences with state parks outside of the occasional visits was actually volunteering at Black or Shannon as a conservation volunteer for Earth Day. So I did that a couple of years, uh, just kind of getting in, getting out there, learning the park, um, learning about working for state parks, getting to know the employees. And, at that time, I was working construction and trying to finish up school. And once I was ready to put my degree to use, I decided to get my foot in the door as a semi-skilled laborer at Black Machan. And the next season, moved to a Ranger One position, still at Black Machan. And I did that for I had four or five seasons. In 2017, actually, I, it just hit me today. It was May 15th, 2017 my birthday, I loaded up my truck in State College at six in the morning and drove down to Quaker Town where the Region 4 headquarters are um, and started my official position as a Region 4 trainee uh, four years ago tomorrow and got there and they handed me a set of keys and said drive up to Lackawanna State Park and go run that. Uh, my trainee experience was a little different than a lot of the other trainees. Normally you just spend a week here and there and like I said, for me, they were just like, hey, here's these keys, go run this park. Yeah, Memorial Day's in two weeks, you'll figure it out. We think we can pick things up. Great. You seem like a smart guy. Um, I'm still here, so I guess it worked out. I was there for about three months, went to Ridley Creek State Park down in the southeast, where I really got my first experience of more of an urban park. Like I said, I grew up in State College. I was work I was used to going to Whipple Dam, going swimming, and being surrounded by 80,000 acres of state forest. That is what I knew a state park to be. It was very different when you're driving around and you can just see the skyline of Philadelphia if you're standing on the highest peak in the park. So it was a new experience. And then you're dealing with the landowners around you. It's all private land. It's, it's something else. It's a different management style you got to learn to deal with. Um, in January 2018, I went to Memorial Lake and Spatera State Parks. 
not too far from here. Uh, it's still a trainee, but then eventually got that as the official manager. Um, you know, awesome area, awesome park, dealt with some cool stuff. At one point, like 50% of some terra washed away. <laughs> so got, got some good experiences there. Um, that was some flooding. That was 2018 when we had like three 500 year floods in six weeks, I think. Uh, in 2019, I went to French Creek State Park. Uh, that, that also has Marsh Creek State Park as a satellite park to there. So that was a little bit more of the urban park. Uh, French Creek is really unique because it is within the Hopewell Big Woods. So you do have a lot of uh, public land and or surrounding it, but you still get a lot of the urban visitors coming in from the surrounding metropolitan areas such as uh, Philadelphia and Reading and Pottstown. Um, so definitely a lot of unique challenges there again, but it, it was still more of a more of the environment I was used to with the large campground and lakes. And last August, I got the opportunity to come here to Pine Grove Furnace State Park. Um, yeah, another another step in the career. Um, the job opened, and I decided to go for it. Um, so I would love to say I have some special connection to the area. I think people always want to hear that. Honestly, I had never been here until I went on the park tour. But as soon as I came, I you know I really saw what was going on here. Um, the area itself was reminded me a lot of State College, where it was that quintessential State Park with the hiking, the swimming all the different activities, and then you're surrounded by the state forest. So it really it reminded me of what I was used to, of kind of my perfect idea of a state park. Um, even though I didn't didn't grow up here, and I can't tell you heartwarming stories of the park, I, as a park manager, I have a unique connection um, to every state park. Uh, kind of how, I mentioned I went to school for recreation park management. Um, yeah, I specifically remember them talking about Teddy Roosevelt and John Muir and the foresight that they had to go out and protect these lands for the public. Uh, yeah, that really hit me and it was inspirational. And that's kind of the connection I have to every state park and why every time I go to a new park, it may be a new environment, but it always feels like home. Um, so, I mean, really, my connection is more to protecting the overall resources, keeping it open to the public. Being a part of the people out there that are listening to the visitors, deciding what needs the park needs, uh, visitors and resources, what direction DCR needs to go. I like being a part of that guidance of keeping these parks around, making sure the visitors are safe, the resources are safe, and this land remains what it is very unique and special resource that we do have in Pennsylvania. Um, so yeah, I really feel like I've been lucky in coming to Pine Grove because it, it did quickly become home. Uh, warm welcome by the by a lot of the visitors, by the staff. Um, very, very happy with my decision to come here and definitely feel lucky. Uh, I, I think my favorite thing about the park, you know, I, I said it is just like a quintessential park with all the general activities, but then I, I, every week I learned something new about this park and the history of it. Um, it's amazing just hiking around. The one day I was hiking around, and I was like, what are these concrete structures in the middle of the woods? And then I was talking to Andre and the friends group, and he was telling me about like an amusement park that I was back there. I'm like, what is now? Like, you have to be mistaken. <laughs> but yeah, there was like an amusement park here at one time. So it's just amazing the way the history has been preserved. And um, the way we are able to then utilize that to educate the public, which is a huge part of the mission statement with DC and R and state parks. Um, you know, a lot of people ask me, what is a park manager? And I try to describe what I do during a day and it never makes any sense. And I'm like, I feel like it did more than that. You know, I don't even, I, I do so much, it's hard for me to tell you what I actually do. So I usually just try to break it down into, I'm a problem solver and a coordinator kind of. Um, a lot of it is just keeping things running, uh, just overseeing the general operations of the park. Uh, some days, you know, a lot of it's the typical stuff that you would think, um, the hiring, uh, 
making sure policies are being followed, uh, making sure we have the supplies we need, yada, yada, yada. Um, but I, there's also days where, yeah, you know, I, I'm out, I like to be out on the weekends with my duty belt on and working with my rangers and kind of remembering why I got into state parks. There's days if, if we're short staffed, you might see me cleaning restrooms. So I literally do everything in the park. Wow. <laughs> I just made more hours in the day. Um, so, yeah, and I, I think a large, a, a big part of my job, it's something that you really can't define. It, it's more understanding the needs of the visitors, the resources, and the stakeholders, and helping give a direction of the park uh, with guidance from my regional staff and central office. And keep everybody safe and figure out what direction we need to go, what policies do we need to institute. Is the park being used in different ways than it was before? We've definitely seen that recently uh, with the higher visitation and just different user groups coming in, new new users, that's been a big thing. People who've never never been outdoors and they're you know, they're awestruck because they saw a deer. I'm like I've seen too many the only time I am awestruck when I see deer is hunting season because they disappeared. Um so, yeah, I mean, that's, like, that, hopefully that sums up my job. I don't know. Maybe yeah, I yeah. Well, I mean, it sounds like this is, um, this is a, a learning experience for you and you're connecting with new user groups and growing as an individual. So we're, we're thrilled to have you in the South Mountain region. We're very, you know, happy that we have you at, at the helm along with the friends group there at Pine Grove Furnace State Park. And yeah, yeah uh, welcome to the South Mountain Partnership family. Um, there's no uh, no getting away now. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I do just want to end with saying I've been very impressed with the South Mountain Partnership um, and the way you're able to collaborate with the stakeholders, the uh, various organizations, and different agencies. Uh, you know, I've worked at a, quite a few parks, and you, you don't always have that. Um, I've seen it a lot of times where you do have all the agencies and organizations and nonprofits. They're all working towards the same goal, but they're kind of taking different paths. And a lot of the times that is literally trying to just make a path. <laughs> and you don't have that communication. And you can literally end up having a path where you have one part of it here, one here, and it's not connecting. I really feel like the what I've seen here with this partnership. Um, you really help with that communication, keeping everybody on the same page and getting a unified understanding of what's going on. So thank you for having me and uh, look forward to what the future brings. Yeah, absolutely, Chris. Thank you again. And much of that coordination is due to um, the Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources hosting the Conservation Landscape Program, um, providing competitive funding to us through the Environmental Stewardship Fund and our partners at the Appalachian Trail Conservancy and their landscape conservation program as well. So it, you know, and then all of you guys, all of the local folks on the ground. Um, so thank you to everyone. Again, our, our presenters and speakers, um, thank you to the program committee for helping to uh, plan today's event. Tyler Sender, Elizabeth Grant, Julia Chain, uh, Claire Jantz. Um, hope I'm not missing anyone. If I am, Tyler, Elizabeth, or Julia, feel free to chime in. But I know we kept you over, but I hope you feel as though it was worth it. I know I do. Um, so, Tyler, is there anything that you wanted to say before we let people go? Can't hear you. <laughs> oh no. Sometimes technology. So um, I'm not sure if Tyler's coming back or not. <laughs> Sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, thank you again. We will be following up with you via a follow up email. And we will be posting today's video recording on our YouTube page, and we'll share that out via our newsletter, our website, and our social media. Thanks once again, and I hope that you all have a wonderful weekend.
Take care, all.